Good afternoon and welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and I'm pleased that you could join us whether you're here in the theater or joining us on our YouTube channel. Before we hear from Carrie Kennedy talking about her new book, Robert F. Kennedy, Ripples of Hope, I'd like to invite you all to return to the National Archives for our amazing celebration of independence. Our celebration begins the weekend of June 30th with chocolate tastings and musical performances on the Constitution Avenue steps. Then on Tuesday, July 3rd at noon, you can hear from two founding fathers in person, Joseph Doyle and Stephen Edenbow. will portray John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and take questions from the audience. These same two folks will be with us on the 4th of July on the steps reading the Declaration of Independence. On July 4th itself, we start the festivities with a free t-shirt giveaway for the first 1,000 guests. Then we'll have more music, a dramatic reading of the Declaration of Independence, and family activities all day. There's a program um, in our online calendar of events at archives.gov. Check out our website and sign up um, at the table outside the theater to get email updates, and you'll also find more information about National Archives activities and events. Robert Kennedy devoted his life to public service. His actions as Attorney General and United States Senator are well documented in the holdings of the National Archives in the John F. Kennedy Library. Just this month, we marked the 50th anniversary of his death and recall the feelings of shock and disbelief that swept over the nation in June 1968. Amid that sense of loss, however, there was also a realization that Kennedy's message and legacy reached far and wide across the country and across many peoples. How widespread that influence was could be seen immediately along the train tracks that carried Kennedy's funeral train from New York to Washington, D.C. The forward to Ripples of Hope opens with scenes of that slow train procession. In the photographs of the thousands of mourners who lined the tracks, we vividly see how deeply Kennedy had moved people from many walks of life. Kerry Kennedy's book, new book shows how Kennedy's words, life, and values have influenced their lives, choices, and actions of her interview subjects over the past 50 years and continue to inspire people today. Kerry Kennedy is the president of Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights and founder of RFK Compass. She has worked on a range of issues including child rights, child labor, indigenous land rights, judicial independence, ethnic violence, the environment, and freedom of expression. She's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Being Catholic Now, and Speak Truth to Power, Human Rights Defenders Who Are Changing Our World. Speak Truth has grown to include a ph photography exhibit, a play by Broadway play playwright Ariel Dorfman, an award-winning website, a documentary film, and an education toolkit. A graduate of Brown University and Boston College Law School, she received the Social Activism Award from the World Summit of Nobel Peace Prize laureates, along with many other awards and honorary degrees. Our moderator for today's discussion is Peter Edelman, the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Law and Public Policy at Georgetown University Law Center, where he teaches constitutional law and poverty law and is faculty director of the Georgetown Center on Poverty and Inequality. He's also served in three branches of, of all three branches of government. He was a legislative assistant to Senator Robert F. Kennedy and issues director for Senator Edward Kennedy's 1980 presidential campaign. During President Clinton's first term, he was counselor to Secretary of Health and Human Services, Donna Shalala, and then assistant secretary for planning and evaluation. Before working for Robert Kennedy, he clerked for Supreme Court Justice Arthur J. Goldberg, and before that, for Judge Henry J. Friendly of the U.S. Court of Appeals. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kerry Kennedy and Peter Edelman. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Peter Edelman. That's Kerry Kennedy. <laughs> Got that straight. Uh, I want to tell you a, a couple things. One is I've known Kerry since she was six years old. And uh, there's a 
you could say not that much happened because it was pretty terrific to start with. But in any <laughs> case, uh, uh, you, you heard about her. I will just uh, underline, she is one of the great human rights leaders uh, in our country and in the world. And I'm so delighted that we're still friends and that we still th do things together. It's just marvelous, uh, including the, the chance to do this today, Carrie. Uh, and I also want to say uh, that this is a fantastic book. Uh, and uh, I just want to be shameless. Everybody has to buy this book. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I had the, the, I've had the chance to uh, read it and then go over it a second time. We, we did this together with, with actually with my wife uh, uh, and our friend LaDonna Harris at the uh, JFK Library. So we're doing a little uh, read. We're seeing a wonderful new audience. Anyway, let's, let's, let's do it. Uh, first, so we've practiced. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the first question, because I think people are, are interested in this, Carrie, and, and that is, why did you write this book? So I, um, you know, there are a lot of biographies about my father, exactly. and so I didn't want to, to revisit, spend a, a, a book really revisiting the past but really looking at his values and vision and how they apply to the issues that we face today as a country and will face for the next 50 years. Um, I interviewed a wide range of people, some who knew my father and worked closely with him, like your wife, Marion Wright Edelman, um, uh, Congressman John Lewis, who's the great civil rights activist, Harry Belafonte, um, um, Tony Bennett, and others, and then um, other people had, have never met my father, people like Van Jones, um, people like George Clooney, uh, and, and uh, Tim Cook from Apple, Howard Schultz um, from Starbucks, but had their lives influenced greatly by him, consider him their lodestar and their hero, and, and look to him when they're making difficult decisions. So I, uh, I interviewed them, and it was really interesting because um, when I interviewed them, uh, I kept thinking about this line that, that Hillary Clinton had, which is, she said, I'm like a Rorschach test. When you ask people about me, you learn more about them than you learn about me. And um, it was really interesting, and the, the book is really fun because you learn a lot about Bobby Kennedy but you also learn about, about these other people who continue to influence our country. Uh, let, me, let me just uh, go another round uh, on this, Carrie, uh, and, and you've started into it, but talk a little bit more uh, about what you learned. You began that, but some more examples of what you have learned well, so, from Well, so, I mean, <laughs> Some of the stories that I heard from people that aren't really about my father, but reflect why this type of person would be interested in my father. So Tony Bennett, so we all know Tony Bennett, right? Like all of us know who he is and, and feel like, okay, so he told these interesting stories. So he said that he grew up in abject poverty in Queens, New York, and his mother um, took in laundry and she, no, not laundry, sewing. And whenever she got to a dress that she felt was uh, not up to her standard, she'd throw it on the floor and say, I don't do low quality work. And so that stuck with him. And, and when he joined the, the record industry and the, um, his agents would say, try and get him to, to play you know, the most popular song, he'd say, no, I don't do any low quality songs. And that's why, to this day, you can listen to a Tony Bennett song from five decades ago or three decades ago and still feel like it's very you know, uh, um, modern because he only did the classics. Um, but then he told this interesting story about that he was always a pacifist. And he was inducted into the army during World War II. And when they found out he was a pacifist, they sent him to the German front. And he went, he was in the Battle of the Bulge, and he, um, he, he wouldn't pick up a gun, but the Allies won that, won that battle. 
And he and his colleagues went into the next town, marched into the next town, and they came to a Nazi prison camp. And they freed all the prisoners. So who knew that about Tony Bennett? And then he talked about being invited by Harry Belafonte to march in Selma with Martin Luther King and going there. And he has an amazing story there about, um, and Peter, you might know the name of this woman, but so there was the first Selma march, mm -hmm. which was uh, known as Bloody Sunday. Yeah. And then there was going to be a, then there were two other Selma marches within a few days. So Bloody Sunday, when, when there was a massacre by, the, um, by actually Klan members dressed up in police uniforms uh, who had been deputized by the local police in Selma. And um, that was broadcast across the televisions around in the United States and around the world. And so there's a woman in Detroit. She's the mother. She's white. She is the mother of five children. Vi Viola Vi Liuzzo. OK, so Viola Liuzzo. So she said, I, I got to go there. I got to go and help. So she went down from Detroit. She went to the summit. And her job was to drive people back and forth to the airport. She drove Tony, you might not even know this, she drove Tony from the Selma air, from Selma up to Montgomery, turned around, and on her way back, she was killed by the Klan. So, I mean, I've always known that she was killed by the Klan. That's well documented, but I never knew it was, she was yeah. dropping off Tony Bennett at the time. So that's kind of interesting, but um, then he, uh, so then he talked about his career a bit, and then he said um, he, he was invited to sing at the Super Bowl. And I said, wow, so would you sing? And he said, no low quality songs. And I was like, like what? And he said, well, I sang America the Beautiful. He did not want to sing um, the Star Spangled Banner because he's a pacifist, and he feels like it was glorifying, glorifying war. And this really comes back to my father again, because during Daddy's 1968 campaign, he said that as president, he wanted to change the national anthem to this land is your land, because he felt like that was more reflective of the community of America. Mm. Uh, we could go on, because there's, yeah, uh, there's so much more. I was going to ask <laughs> you uh, about Harry <laughs> Belafonte. Maybe we'll come back to that, yeah. uh, because it's uh, the, the, so interesting about him having uh, and only learning this uh, in, from the book and his talking about it, but growing up in, seg in a segregated uh, neighborhood in Harlem. And at the, of course, that, it's terrible to be segregated. But he, uh, all of the great, uh, like Du Bois and, and others, were there and, and accessible. And he met them as a little kid just because they lived around the corner. Uh, anyway, let's, let's get by, by on more about your dad. Uh, and, and particularly, uh, I uh, find, uh, in fact, my, my son uh, actually said this to me, that in, in looking at all the documentaries, uh, it tends to be about Robert Kennedy as a public person, uh, which of course is very important. But we don't learn very much about um, the private uh, Robert Kennedy, which of course you obviously do have. You know, I'm gonna tell you this story about me if, if you want, but I, I wanna tell you something else, yeah. which is different from the last time we talked, and it is I not I know, you wreck here. all my points. I know, well, okay, so this is really interesting. So there's a, a film called Crisis, and it was, well, let me begin here. My most prized possession is a letter that my dad sent to me. Mm -hmm. And it's dated June 11th, 1963, and it says, Dear Carrie, today was a historic day, not just because of your visit to, to my office, but because two African Americans over the objection of the governor, of Governor Wallace, um, uh, uh, registered at the University of Alabama. This happened just a few moments ago, and I hope these events are, are long past by the time you get your pretty little head to college. Love and kisses, Daddy. 
Okay, can you imagine at that moment writing to your kid? He had 11 children, so that was a lot of letters to write. But anyway, um, so during that crisis, uh, which was about 10 days in length, he invited a film crew to come to the Justice Department and go to the Oval Office and film the administration in the midst of grappling with this terrible crisis in America. Okay, try and imagine the openness of government and allowing that to happen just absolutely would not happen today. He then, um, so you see this film, and I just watched the outtakes up at the Paley Center last week, and in this film, you see him talking to his deputies at the Justice Department, Nick Katzenbach and Burke Marshall and others, and he's, he reads this letter, and the letter says in essence, I'm the head of the, the Alabama militia, and we have gathered together every white male between 16 and 65, and we're all equipped with guns, and we're all going to go to Montgomery and defend Governor Wallace, who is standing in the schoolhouse door saying uh, uh, um, segregation today, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. So I want you to know we're all there and we all have guns and no matter how many troops you send, we're gonna have more. And then you see Daddy reading this out loud and then talking to his brother, Uncle Jack, in the White House about how many troops should we have? Should we have 16,000? How many? And then him talking to his deputy saying, well, where are the troops? And how long would it take for them to get from where they are to the university? And how long does it take from the time we call them up for the time they get into the truck? So, okay, that's what's going on. This is the tension. Meanwhile, he's got all these little kids running through his office. And you see this scene of him, and he's on the phone intensely talking like this. And then I come around, you know, three years old, around the corner of his desk, and he puts his hand out, and he's touching my chin like this. And you're going, what are you doing with the kid? Let go of the kid, get on the phone. I mean, this is like an intense moment. This is scary, really scary stuff. And then what you realize in the course of this film is it's not that the children are a distraction, but it's the relationship, the love of the children that is allowing him to make loving decisions about our country and about the future of our country. And you know, with just with what's happened this week, you can't, it's hard to imagine how an attorney general, Jeff Sessions, could sit in his office and be surrounded by children and grandchildren and kids like jumping in his lap and touching his face and making a decision then to rip a infant from its mother's breast and then separating that child forever. A child who can never even say what her name is or his name is. The thought that 2,300 children have been taken from their families. And how are they ever going to be reunited? How, the, how is that going to happen? So you just, the connections between what Daddy did 50 years ago and what's happening in our country today and the issues we're going to face for the next 50 years are ever present. And he's a great example. That was so powerful. Um, nonetheless, I, I, and you do talk about it in the book, uh, but the, the, the sense, uh, the, everything that you've said is, is, is so powerful, but the daily life um, is really, really important to understand. Um, and just a little flavor of that. 
Sure. So, well, um, you know, we would get up in the morning and daddy always, um, he, he always had a record player on when he got up and he usually was playing Shakespeare on the record player. And then I would always go down into his bathroom and shave with him. Um, <laughs> so he, he had this old type of razors that um, you had to put a razor blade into the razor and then screw it back on. Do you remember those? Okay, that's because you're really you got a couple. old. <laughs> <laughs> By the time I was shaving, they didn't. Yeah, have they that didn't anymore. have. <laughs> anyway, so um, so he would use his, you know, with the razor, and then he'd give me one without the razor in, and then we would put noxema on each other's faces, and then we would shave together. And um, so you know that tenderness in the midst of God, everything he was working, he was doing and working on. Um, and then at breakfast, we would have always uh, five newspapers and six or seven different kinds of magazines. And we were expected to read the newspaper. And then we were expected to, at dinner time, he'd go around the room and everybody would have to say what they had read that day. And then we would opine on it. And, um, and uh, but what I remember also is we had, I have seven brothers and three sisters, so we had a lot of battles growing up. And um, daddy always resolved them in the same way. And one day in particular, I remember I um, was playing in the magnolia tree outside of our house at Hickory Hill, which is a great climbing tree. There's actually a beautiful magnolia tree on 7th and uh, Constitution here, if you don't know what kind of tree it is, but anyway and really beautiful white flowers. But so my brother Michael and I were playing World War II and uh, he was the Americans and he had the upper fort and I was the doomed Germans and I was supposed to scramble up and, and you know take over the fort. Um, so he was throwing magnolia pods at my head which look like hand grenades but, but feel like rocks. And, um, <laughs> And I took a few hits too many, and I scrambled out of the tree and ran up to my father's study and burst in the door and jumped in his lap with tears streaming down my face and my bow askew and said, Michael's throwing rocks at me. And he said, um, well, you go get Michael and tell him to come here. So I was like, justice will be done. The attorney general wants you in his office now. <laughs> and. Uh, and up came Michael, and um, Daddy said, no, Michael, don't interrupt. Carrie, tell me everything that happened. And I told him the whole story of woe. And then um, he said, now, Carrie, you don't interrupt. Michael, you tell your side of the story. And uh, you know, it was irritating. I don't remember all the details, but I remember I wasn't all right. He wasn't all wrong. And then we had to kiss and make up and go to our rooms and read for an hour. And um, the, the message Daddy had for us is the message he had for our country, which is that you, um, peace is not something just to pray for, but it's something all of us have a responsibility to make every day. And you have to stop seeing your adversaries as your enemies and instead see them as your brothers and sisters. And um, you need to grapple with the truth of your side and the other person's side in, in, in any battle. And then you have to go to your room and read for an hour. So, um, yeah. <laughs> stuck with you. Yeah, it's stuck That's with great. you. That's yeah. great. Oh, there's a lot we could say uh, more just in terms of the poetry and, and reading the Bible and the things you did at dinner and, and all that. But I, let's. Well, it, could, could I interrupt here yeah. for a second? So, Peter, so one of the people I interviewed in this book is Marion Wright Edelman, Peter's wife as Peter mentioned. And um, she, Peter met Marion on a trip with my dad in Mississippi. And um, so maybe you could you talk a little bit about daddy. And Peter also has an amazing book out that's so important right now. And it's called, It's Not a Crime to Be Poor. And it's about the criminalization of poverty here in the United States. And um, some of the, the roots of your interest in that issue started on that trip. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Well, thank you. This is, this is for you, but I'll, I'll, no, I'll well, say something. No, it's all the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that okay um, with you guys? 
Yeah, but, see, they love But it, it is true, uh, <laughs> as you know, that uh, who I turn out to be uh, uh, is not who I would have been, I think, if I hadn't met your father and worked for him. And I've worked on issues that relate to poverty uh, and related things uh, ever since. Uh, in, in particular, uh, we uh, went down uh, with a subcommittee uh, about the war on poverty and uh, getting it uh, reauthorized. You had to get it through Congress every couple of, of years. And so we did, uh, all over the country we had hearings, and we went to Mississippi because there was a very large Head Start program there, which. Uh, was nonprofit uh, and the the state uh, government, uh, all all the power brokers uh, hated it because it was it was a very big, 21 counties, and they they tried to destroy it if they could. So the 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 uh, subcommittee went down there to get it a national because your dad would be there. There would be television as there was, and so Can on. Can you just stop for one second? Because yeah. it, I don't think it's clear as to why the state power brokers government would want to destroy a program that's uplifting people in poverty in 21 counties in the state. So can you just Sure, well, that uh, for number one, why is it that way? Because the way the law was written, if the state wouldn't take it, uh, the, the federal government had the power to just go right past them and get the money to go directly to people down in the community, which was a very big point with, with, with your father. But secondly, the people who were running the, the Head Start were all people who'd been involved in the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the Voting Act of, of 1965 had been passed, uh, and here were these people, sure, they were uh, helping little kids, you know, that's what Head Start is, but they were all people who were doing community building and, and uh, essentially building political power there, and it was driving the, the governor and the rest of them crazy. Uh, and they want as many uh, people uh, out of building that kind of capacity uh, as they could. So that's why they wanted to de de destroy it. Uh, and it gets us to the to the other the thing that happened, which is why you asked me the question. Uh, because when we got down there, uh, Marion Wright, who uh, I'm so lucky just married me, um, but she was a civil rights lawyer and she testified there and she was also happened to be the general counsel that had Head Start in addition to her other uh, w uh, work as a civil rights lawyer. And she said to uh, the senators and the, the people there, uh, you need to know that what has happened here in Mississippi, that there are people in Mississippi Delta, children and, and people of all ages, who uh, were in, in uh, very, very terrible malnutrition, um, really uh, quite close to, to, to starving. Shock. Uh, and so the, the, that, that was enough for the committee to go up to the, uh, the Mississippi Delta and see for themselves. Uh, and indeed, uh, we went there, and, and I used the word shock. Well, they, uh, Senator and others and I, saw these children uh, in, in uh, the United States with these swollen bellies, uh, just rags and swollen bellies and, and sores on their arms and uh, legs that were not he healing. Uh, and uh, there was CBS uh, Dan Shore there, some of you may remember NPR Dan Shore. So it was on national television that night. Uh, and uh, your father, uh, as you well know, would take on when, when he had some, um, something like that, and there were others, maybe not, not as dramatic, but they would be added to the list. Uh, meeting Cesar Chavez, then we were on behalf of the uh, f farm workers, that sort of thing. He always said, when you see a problem, uh, you try to solve them. That was a major thing that he said. My, my wife just wrote a, a column for something and picked that out and reminded us that he said that. And she put a big, uh, it, it, yeah. Um, so this comes back to you because uh, you, he comes back, comes home that night, and that's what you thought of it, uh, and what happened? So he came home that night from Mississippi, and he was 
Now, I, as I said, I had a very, I had a lot of siblings, and there was, when somebody says, describe your childhood, the one word that comes to mind is loud. <laughs> and uh, he walked into the room, and it was dead silent, and he was just standing there. It was so powerful, and he said, I'd just come from a part of this country where three families live in the room, in a room the size of this one, and you've got to help those children. It was the only time in my entire life that I can remember either of my parents or any of the adults in our lives saying, you know, a directive about being involved in, in social justice. Yeah. And, and um, of course, um, we know uh, from when we lost him how uh, strong uh, people had about him. Well, what, what do you think made people uh, to feel so, uh, have that powerful feelings for him? Well, I think that Daddy, um, I think, you know, in, re in writing this book, it became really clear to me that it wasn't a particular position or it wasn't a particular um, specific vision for the future as much as it was that he called forth the best in all of us. And so people, you know, if you talk to 20 people about him, you'll get 20 different answers about why it was important to them. But what they'll have in common is he spoke to, to me when I'm at my very best. And that's the most powerful thing you can do. The, you know, I come from a political family, and the easiest way to get elected is by appealing to people's um, fear and anger and hatred. And he appealed to just the opposite of that. It's an easy way to get elected, but it's an impossible way to govern. And that's why this White House, incidentally, is so um, unable to get stuff done, because, uh, because they haven't built a constituency across our country. But um, that's really what Daddy spent that 1968 campaign trying to heal the divisions in our country. So I think that's part of it. I think part of it is his belief that um, one person can make a difference, um, and that, which was so uh, central to his being. And then I think, you know, mostly it was his moral imagination. And, and then that moral imagination, um, some people would call it empathy, but it goes a little bit deeper and wider than that. But that's what saved us from nuclear annihilation during the Cuban Missile Crisis, because he was able to see beyond um, Khrushchev's uh, you know, pro-war palaver and instead say that Khrushchev, just like Uncle Jack, had a military industrial complex that was calling him to war, forcing him to war, that Khrushchev probably had the same thing, but that the leaders didn't want war. And being able to see that or imagine that, he, he and Jack were able to, to stop us from going to war. It was that same moral imagination that allowed him in 1968 on April 4th, the day that Martin Luther King was killed, to talk toward, to a crowd in Indianapolis um, this was a, a crowd that was, that was built for his campaign by Congressman John Lewis and, and by other local community organizers in Indianapolis. And it was in the largest African community, African American community in that city. Most of the people had come early and had been waiting for hours for my father to arrive. And they hadn't heard the news about Dr. King. But people in the back of the crowd had heard the news. And they came with bicycle chains and Molotov cocktails and chair legs, and they were ready to riot. And Daddy got up in front of that crowd, and he said, for those of you who are angered uh, and tempted towards hatred by the injustice of this act, I can say that I have felt the, those same types of feelings because I had a, a, a member of my own family killed, and he was killed by somebody with a gun. Now, try and imagine 
a presidential candidate standing in front of a crowd ready to riot and saying, I understand your feelings. Mm. And then he said, but what we need in the United States is not division. What we need in the United States is not violence. What we need in our country is a sense of compassion towards those who still suffer in our country, whether they're white or whether they're black. And because of that moral imagination, Indianapolis didn't burn that night. 125 other cities across our country yeah. did. Yeah. You know, and we forget today because we think, oh my God, our country is so divided. But in 1968, like Philadelphia was basically under martial law for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And Joe Biden talks about living in Philadelphia at that time. Our country was terribly, terribly divided. And, um, you know, in the midst of that, Daddy said, peace and justice and compassion towards those who suffer. That's what the United States should stand for. And that's what I'll do if I'm elected president of the United States. I think today, that's what our country is yearning for. You know, black and white, young and old, rich and poor, red and blue, we want a leader who will stand up there and say we can come together and we can be a better country and we can do this together and challenge us to be our best selves again. And that's why I think this book is so important. Mm. Uh, that's beautiful. Uh, l l let me just, in terms of, of sort of dig um, digging a little bit more into why there was such broad support uh, for him. Um, the, the, uh, uh, this is Bono, um, and uh, he says, uh, was Kennedy a liberal? Yes. A, a hippie? Never, never. None of the Kennedys, as far as I know, went in for the flowers in the hair thing. Bono talk. Yeah. The Kennedys from my world are punk rock. They wear marching boots, not Birkenstocks. And you know, there's a boot there. And I felt it actually on occasion. Um, well, what do you think about that? Uh, well, I think he's got a point. You know, I think that that in a way the reason that daddy was taken seriously when he said peace and compassion is because people knew that he was tough you mm -hmm. know and people knew that that he had fought in world war ii mm -hmm. and that his his brother joe had won four different types of medals and mm -hmm. that his brother jack had had almost died and saved three people's lives mm -hmm. and uh and that um daddy went up against the mob and even after the the mob had had um had threatened to throw acid in um in me and my siblings eyes that um, daddy did not let up. So I think that he was seen as tough and that's, that's how he could be seen as um, compassionate. But can I just read something else from sure. oh, 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 From right there? Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, because this is so, I mean, this is so beautiful. Is that still Bono? Yeah. Okay, here he is. I just, I, I love this part of the book. So do you mind? Okay, so he says, um, he's just talking about being Irish, and this is, um, this is why I love this book so much, because you learn so much about the people, but um, in it, you learn about Daddy and the people, but he said, you have no idea what this meant and what it still means to us in Ireland. Those of, who, of, those of us whose ancestors missed the boat, you know, we stuck around, we ate the potatoes. By the 1960s and 70s, when I was growing up in Dublin, you could almost taste the regret in having stayed put. 
or maybe that was, the, that was defeat we were tasting, or ashes. Either way, you cannot exaggerate the miserableness or the miserableism of Ireland at that time. The troubles which Teddy Kennedy did more than most to put an end to, the economy, the brain drain, it was like the famous dampness of Ireland had finally soaked into our collective spirit and for all that Irish resilience and defiance, all our bluff and bravado, our souls had the chills and we couldn't shake them. Yeah. Let me just, uh, while we're on Bono, just very quickly, uh, this whole thing is wonderful. Uh, but he says, um, a little bit later on, he says uh, the trademark, Bobby's trademark, was the rolled up sleeves. A man at work, just a hint of muscle, dreaming of the world as it isn't, yes, but dealing with the world as it is. The most important things getting done. And that is why Bobby Kennedy looms lot large in my life. Mm -hmm. um, how would you sum this up? We we're going to take some questions here uh, in terms of what he would think about where we are now. I mean, I think, look, we've come a long way since 1968, and if you have a doubt about that, just go watch a few of the first episodes of Mad Men. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've, we've come a long way as, uh, as women. We've come a long way uh, 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 as, um, as LGBT in the LGBT movement, which didn't, you know, there's, it was completely under cover at that time. Um, we have uh, race relations are, are vastly different, although there are still enormous problems that we face as a country. Um, and so I think he'd be very pleased in some fronts but um, horrified, of course, by the hatred being spewed by, by this administration and the responsiveness of so many Americans to that hatred, and not just in our country, but around the world. And I think that he'd be deeply concerned by the divisions in our country that are still being exploited for political gain, um, and especially, uh, frustrated and angered by the injustices now mm -hmm. um, now underway in in Texas where I'm going to right after this event how are you good, so, good. straight there good so uh, so, so serious uh, do we have we have uh, microphones uh, there is a question I think you're coming yes thank you very much for being here today um, I'm a college student here in the Washington DC area and for many years I've been, I've been deeply interested in learning and reading about your father. It's been, it's been, a very, it's been very much a long-term interest for me. Um, one thing that I was wondering is what would you say were some of the most meaningful ways in which your father's visit to South, in which your parents visit to South Africa in 1966 impacted them and what would you say were some of the most meaningful impacts that your father's visit and his Ripple of Hope speech had in South Africa? Oh, thanks. Thanks so much for that question. Well, um, I was actually really lucky enough to go to South Africa on the 50th anniversary with um, six members of Congress, including John Lewis, and two of the women um, who, uh, do you remember in South Carolina when there was that terrible shooting in the church? and um, two women who survived that, uh, that massacre for, went to the fellow who killed their family members and their friends in their, in their Bible study group and said, I forgive you the next day. So those two women came with us and 23 Kennedys. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was an extraordinary visit and I think, you know, um, we had a chance to talk to so many of the people who were there when my father visited and were impacted by his visit. It was an incredible 
moment because um, Daddy had, as Peter said, his hands full here. Um, and a, a, a student from South Africa somehow made his way into Daddy's office, but it, it, was, it wasn't really planned. It was, you know, sort of happenstance and said it would mean a lot for us, to us, if you would come. And he said, okay, well, I'll come. And then he tried to get a visa. Of course, the U.S. government was supporting that, the apartheid government very strongly at the time and did not want him to go and discouraged him from going. And the South African government said, we do not want you here. And he applied and he worked on it for about six months and he finally got the visas. And um, they had, I think it was about uh, 30 members of the press who were going with them. And the South African government um, took away all the press visas two days before the trip. And so my mother and my father went up, ended up going with about three or four people. They got on the ground in South Africa, and it was a very, very tense time in that country. And the South African government said, you can't meet with any members of the government, and we're taking away your security detail. And their first event was in, uh, was in uh, Soweto, and it was in the heart of the, this African, uh, black African township where people were forced to go and live. Um, and there were tens of thousands of people there who had come out to see them. And it really set the tone for the entire trip. Um, my father was so horrified by the impact of South Africa of, of the apartheid system. He saw the connections between the racism in the United States and the racism there. Um, and he um, thought there was a way to reach out to people who, um, who were benefiting from the apartheid system but might be called upon to question the system that was empowering them. And that's what he did. He went to all the, he, he essentially went from one university to the next throughout that entire country. And, um, and most of those, all of those universities were white. And it was, you know, they were all white universities because blacks couldn't go. And one after another, he said, you need to question authority. And, uh, and that generation did, and that's what really helped uh, 30, 25 years later to pull down that government. But um, it had, so he had a big impact on South Africa at the time, it was right after the Rivonia trials, which is where, um, when Nelson Mandela was, was imprisoned, it was at a time when the South African government had really cracked down on, on anti-apartheid activists, had gone on killing spree, um, and then had exiled um, hundreds and hundreds of activists as well. And uh, just to give you a sense of my parents, got the, the, they were flying in a private plane from Johannesburg to Cape Town and um, Robben Island, which is where Mandela and all of his colleagues were imprisoned is right outside of Cape Town and he got the pilot to go and sort of buzz over the island and tip his wings. And that was kind of one of the, the small acts that my father did during that trip that really made an enormous difference to people. But um, I think that, uh, that seeing the resilience, seeing the resistance, and seeing and witnessing the capacity of youth to create change gave him hope. And um, seeing the horrendous poverty and oppression made him, urged him on to, uh, to fight even harder for justice in our country and around the world. So I've been getting impacted both sides. Mm. Thanks for that question. Hi. Hi. 
thank you so much for being here. Um, I feel like I'm going to cry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm one of the multitude of people in my generation who so felt so strongly about your father and how much he meant as a beacon of what a social justice warrior should be. And um, I still have a photograph that uh, the Village Voice photographer Fred McDowell took of him touring the Lower East Side slums where you see him in a windowsill, you know, framed in my study. And I'm wondering if you, um, if there's anybody on the current scene that evokes, you know, the multitude of wonderness of your father. Um, and that you feel strongly about. I must say, I was at a fundraiser last night for um, Beto O'Rourke, and um, I felt something that I hadn't felt since those days, and the Times sort of replicated that in saying he was Kennedy-esque in an article today. And I didn't know if there was anybody else that you felt had you know, mm. all, the, the attributes that you could see your father you know, mm. supporting. You might say who Beto was. Well, you well, he's uh, running for the Senate yes, uh, in, in Texas, Texas. Mm -hmm. the Democratic uh, uh, candidate, candidate. For, yes, yes. Yeah. running uh, against Ted Cruz. Right. No. Um, May he win. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, thank you for that question. First of all, thank you for sharing that. That means uh, a lot to me. Um, you know, when, when, when Jack died, a lot of people said to Daddy that when his, when his brother died, so did their hope. And um, Daddy was always moved by that sentiment, but ultimately he thought that um, the best way, and he said that the best way to pay tribute to his brother was not to mourn his loss, but to learn the lessons of his life and apply them to today. And I think that is true of my father as well. So um, I think there are, I mean, I, I feel very hopeful when I hear a lot of politicians. Politicians have such a bad reputation and often for good reason, but there are a lot of good people out there. And most, I mean, I grew up with politicians. You all live in Washington. I mean, most people are going to work every day and trying to make the world a better place, and you know, they're doing the best that they can, just like the rest of us. And they make mistakes and they do stupid things, but they're basically just trying to make it all work. And um, so, I mean, that's my experience anyway. But I've been around Democrats. What can I tell you? But, <laughs> but um, I think you know. I think that the, that there are people. I think of Elizabeth Warren, who I have so much respect for, and Eddie Markey, who's been trying so hard for so many years to make things better. And there are many, many others uh, across our country. Um, but the one who I think evokes mostly my father is my nephew, Joe Kennedy. So Congressman Joe Kennedy. So if you're not aware of him, keep an eye out for him because he's really extraordinary. And then the other person who's, I think, on the, the world stage today that um, more than anybody has, the, has that uh, similar sort of impact and vision and demand on, on, our, on our values and our best instincts is Pope Francis. And I, uh, I think he's a man who's, who has brought hope where there was despair, who constantly says that we need to think about people who are living in poverty and give a preferential option to the poor, um, and, that, um, and that he's questioning authority and, and trying to change a very difficult institution. So I, uh, I, he, he reminds me there's a lot of echoes there of my dad as well. Yeah, and, and I would uh, add the, the, the obvious, and you sort of said it, which is that uh, there are those uh, people who uh, we do respect and so on, but it's our responsibility, all of us, uh, to make the change. Oh, just, yeah. just to add that. Yeah. I, I think we have one, yes. one Thank more. Thank you so much for visiting us here. And uh, I just have one question. In the current political climate, uh, what do you think would be the best approach for 
social justice? Um, well, I think that, uh, you know, the, 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 the big difference between victims and, um, and people who feel hope is action. So, you know, as Peter said, Daddy always felt like if you see a wrong, try and right it, which is important. And actually, you know, I was sitting in my office yesterday and we had this sort of meeting with all of the, the interns and one of the people in our office was saying, was going around the room and saying, what do you do for self-care when you get overwhelmed by the problems in our country? What do you do? And people are talking about taking a walk, playing with their dog, deep breathing. And I said, yeah, you gotta get out there and change something. That's what's gonna make you feel better. <laughs> so I, you know, you need to do all those other things as well and they're important, but if you really wanna feel like things are changing, you gotta go and change them. And so I think uh, there, there are a lot of avenues to do that, a lot. And um, we, we don't always, we can't always be the, as Daddy said again and again, few people are going to be able to change history alone, but each of us can change a small portion of events. And um, that's where this, the title of this book is Ripples of Hope, and that's from that speech. Um, so I think uh, get involved in your community, get involved in your, uh, in your place of worship, Get, uh, go march. We should all be not sitting here listening to Peter and I, but out there marching right now. There's a march today from 12 to 1 at, at the Capitol on behalf of uh, the immigrants. So uh, there will be another one. It's June 30th. Is it June 30th? At the White House. Um, so spend the next few days calling all your friends and getting them to come out there. And you know what we learned this week? We learn that this White House bows to pressure. How great is that? So let's do it. Let's keep the pressure on. All right. Thanks. Well, thank you, Carrie. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and you're, you're going to sign books. Yeah, thank you all for coming. I think we're selling books someplace. Where, where is that? One level up in the archives bookstore. OK. So come on up, buy some books. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Peter. We did it.